Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Critical Power, Circuit Protection, sponsored by ASCO. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with the Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System Policy, please take a few moments to read the Quality Assurance slide. Now here's the list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. We'll cover these in today's presentation. Tom Earp and John Yoon. Tom Earp is a principal and the MEP engineering director at PAGE. His specialty is the design of highly reliable, cost-effective data centers. He is Certified Uptime Institute accredited tier designer and has been instrumental in developing and improving design standards and guidelines for some of the largest data center builders in the country. Tom is a member of AFCOM and the Green Grid and is registered to practice engineering in multiple states. He was a 2015 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner. John Yoon is a senior staff electrical engineer for McGuire Engineers in Chicago. He has nearly 20 years of experience in the design of electrical distribution systems, and his project experience covers a broad spectrum, including high-rise building infrastructure renewal programs, tenant build-outs, mission-critical data centers, good manufacturing practice clean room facilities, and industrial facilities. Both of our speakers are members of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Thank you, Tom and John, for joining us today. And Tom, you are our first speaker, and the floor is all yours. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to focus on circuit protection. We will cover some basic definitions from the NEC, and then we will take an in-depth look into fuses and circuit breakers. Once we have a common understanding of these devices, we'll talk through a couple of application examples and some related concerns to be aware of. This is an excerpt directly out of the National Electric Code. It was added in 2008 and defines what an overcurrent protective device is, at least for a branch circuit. It, uh, it examines the functions of overcurrent protective devices, and today we're going to look at two particular types, fuses and circuit breakers. Note that overcurrent protective devices have an upper limit on the amount of current they can interrupt. It's important that an overcurrent protective device has a rating higher than the maximum available fault current that it might see in a particular application. And that leads us to the primary purpose of the National Electric Code, to safeguard people and property from the hazards associated with electricity. Anything we discuss here should be taken in this context. When we consider this goal in respect to fuses and circuit breakers, we arrive at a simple guiding principle. Interrupt unintentional current before it can cause harm to people and minimize potential damage to equipment. Okay, so when we talk about unintentional or objectionable current, we're typically talking about either overloads or faults. So let's start with an overload. The NEC de definition is listed here and essentially says that current flow in excess of normal full load rating that persists for a sufficient length of time would cause damage or dangerous overheating. Note that this is current flowing through the circuit through the normally expected path, but in excess of what the components in that circuit are rated for. This could be sustained locked rotor current associated with a seized motor. It could be too many appliances plugged into one circuit. There are, there are a lot of ways that an overload could appear. In contrast, a fault is where current flows through a path other than the intended load. One weird thing about NEC definitions, they don't formally define a fault. They only define a ground fault, and so that definition is listed here. But line-to-ground faults 
aren't the only potential fault mode. There's also line to neutral faults where the current short circuits the load and goes directly back to the source. And then there are line to line faults where multiple phase conductors come into contact with each other, and this forms an unintended conductive path. Like an overload, there are many different things that can cause this unintended conductive path and a fault. It could be a conductor with damaged insulation that gets too close to a grounded enclosure or other part of the system. It could be someone dropping a metallic tool like a screwdriver or a wrench that accidentally bridges across two phases of live bus. Or it could be something like the picture you see here. This is a 3,000 amp 480 volt switchboard and a small metallic part at the top came loose and fell down through the switchboard, which created an arcing fault between two phases. And you can see from the picture that the amount of energy that was released was enough to bend the steel mesh on one side and buckle the enclosure below it. Uh, faults typically cause much higher current flow than overcurrents do. Great. Now I'm going to hand it over to John to talk a little bit more about fuses. Thanks, Tom. So we've covered, you know, the definition uh, of faults and overload conditions. So moving right along, let's talk a little bit more about uh, specifically overcurrent protection devices, uh, fuses and circuit breakers. Uh, first, we'll discuss the fundamental characteristics of fuses and circuit breakers, you know, some basic definitions, uh, discuss what applicable standards are, uh, how those particular devices work, and then basically um, some fundamental examples on how to apply them to a few generic load types. So uh, let's start with fuses. Uh, fuses have been around for a very long time. The picture that you can see in this slide is part of a ancient 5000 amp 208 volt three-phase live front switchboard from the 1940s. You can clearly identify the individual fuses and the fuse clips that they are seated in. Uh, and oddly enough, this switchboard is still in operation. I only took this picture maybe three or four years ago. Even though fuses have been around for what seems like forever, there, there's no formal definition in Article 100 in the NEC for about what a fuse is. Uh, as such, we have to rely on a definition from another source. There are two applicable standards for fuses, UL, 480, uh, UL 248, according to the slide, and NEMA FU1. Let's use the uh, definition from NEMA. Um, the definition for a fuse is a protective device that opens a circuit during a specified overload condition or overcurrent condition by means of a current responsive element. Um, so based on that definition, the question is, what is an element? And FU1 goes on to further describe what an element is. You know, an element is the fusible portion of the fuse that melts during an overcurrent condition to clear the circuit. So basically, what we're describing here is a sacrificial conductor that melts, maybe even vaporizes depending on the magnitude of the current when that element is exposed to an overcurrent condition. And it opens the circuit to prevent damage to downstream devices. So let's take a look at how a fuse works and how they're constructed. Under normal operating conditions, that element has a reasonably low resistance, so that it functions no differently than any other conductor that's within that circuit. However, in an abnormal operating condition, we depend on that sacrificial element. We either have to have it melt or vaporize to clear uh, a fault or overload condition. Just like any other conductor, that thermal energy is represented by I squared T. If we, happen, if we have that uh, melting or vaporization happen in free air, the act of melting an element and releasing that energy, that in of itself could be uh, potentially dangerous. As such, we somehow have to contain or dissipate that energy. So that element is installed within a cartridge body and is usually surrounded by sand to contain and dissipate that energy. Traditionally, um, single element fuses are a compromise. Um, that fuse is either designed for short circuit or overload protection characteristics. Uh, you can design that single element fuse to melt very quickly and have it be very fast acting, or you can sacrifice that speed and have it be time delay. 
if you think about it, this is a pretty significant trade-off and is unacceptable when you're trying to protect loads, especially if they have very high inrush currents like motors and transformers. To address this issue, the fuse industry came up with a concept of a dual element fuse. It's exactly what it sounds like. You have two separate elements connected together within the fuse, one optimized for a low magnitude overcurrent condition and the other for high magnitude fault conditions. You can find dual element fuses in classes C, C, J, L, R, and T. Um, the vast majority of fuses that you encounter in the low voltage power distribution system market will be dual element fuse types. So there's a, a, an incredible variety of fuse classes, and it can be difficult to keep track of what fuse is used in what type of application. Uh, let's focus on the most common fuses in low voltage power distribution systems that you'll expect to see, namely classes C, C, J, L, R, and T. Uh, we'll start with C, C. Uh, these are smaller general purpose fuses. Typically you use them for small loads. They might be small motors, small control transformers, and things along those lines. The sizes for these C, C class fuses are, uh, go up to about 30 amps. Oh, oh, we have a small typo on the slide. It should read 600 volts, not 600 amperes. Um, due to the fact that they're often installed within equipment, Class CC fuses typically have a higher contact temperature rating than other fuse classes. A uh, normal fuse has a contact temperature rating of about 55 to 75 degrees Celsius, whereas a Class CC fuse has a contact rating of about 95 degrees. Uh, class J fuses, that's next in our list, are all-purpose fuses that come in sizes up to 600 amps. They're not interchangeable with any other class of fuse. They're physically different in size than any of the other fuse classes. Uh, the, they're generally shorter in length than other classes, so the associated fuse clips have to be closer together. Since the fuse clips are closer together, it's physically not possible to insert another class of fuse into those clips. Uh, finally, on this slide, we have Class L fuses, and these are very common in switchboards and for other large loads. You can see that they come in ampacities up to 6,000 amps. Uh, although Class L fuses are generally rated at 200,000 amps interrupt uh, rating, they can also be had at 300,000 amps. Uh, these plant cell fuses are designed to be bolted directly to a bus connection. You know, this type of mechanical connection method means that the fuse isn't going anywhere uh, from the mechanical stresses during a fault. The bolt pattern uh, that you see on these fuses uh, between different ampacities of the same fuse class are slightly different, so you cannot interchange wildly different ampacities of fuses. So you swap something like a 1,000 amp fuse for a 200 amp fuse. Moving on right along, let's go to Class R fuses. Uh, Class R fuses are current limiting fuses and available in sizes up to 600 amps. Uh, these fuses are meant to be a replacement for older Class H and K fuses. Uh, H and K fuses, if you see them in the wild, don't have particularly good interrupt rating characteristics. They typically weren't current limiting and sometimes actually had renewable elements, which means you could replace that fusible element within the cartridge body. And it, it doesn't take much of a stretch of imagination to see that being an issue. As far as what that R stands for in the class R, that stands for rejection. Uh, the fuse blades on the end of the body have a small notch that meets with a specific type of fuse clip. Uh, as such, if you try to install a, a type H or K fuse in a fuse holder intended for an R fuse, the H and K fuses don't have that notch and you wouldn't be able to fully see them in the clip. This effectively prevents you from using a, a type H or K fuse in a fuse clip that was intended for a class R fuse. In, size, in sizes below uh, 100 amps, the notch on that Class R fuse is on a ferrule on one end of the cartridge. For 100 and above, that notch is on a copper blade that extends from the cartridge body. Um, th this is a lot of explanation. If this ex explanation is a bit confusing, don't worry. We have a diagram that will make things a bit clearer in a later slide. Uh, you'll find Class R fuses in a wide variety of applications, up to 600 amps. Um, the two types that you'll typically see are RK1s and RK5s, and we'll talk about those a little bit different a little bit later. And uh, finally, uh, we're going pretty quickly through this, we have uh, Class T fuses. Uh, these are typically available in capacities up to 1,200 amps. They're dimensionally much smaller than the other classes of fuses. Uh, they're typically very fast acting and they have a high degree of current limitation, but they're not as common as other classes. 
but you do occasionally find them where their small size is an advantage. You know, there might be something like a pull-out fuse switch or meter sockets, things along those lines. So we, we've described the various different classes of fuses that we will commonly find in low-voltage distributions. Let's talk about the performance characteristics of those fuses. If we're trying to protect something downstream of that fuse, obviously we are going to care about how long that fuse can hold a certain magnitude of current without melting. We want that fuse element to melt if something abnormal happens. But in the same breath, we don't want nuisance tripping of that fuse. If that happens, you're going to disrupt the load and also have to incur uh, some costs associated with replacing that one-time fuse. And of course, fuses aren't free. Uh, the NEMA standard for fuses clearly defines the required characteristics for each fuse class. The melt time varies depending on the magnitude of current. For example, you can see here in this slide, uh, a class CC fuse needs to hold 135% of its rated opacity for a maximum clearing time of 60 minutes. Uh, if you go for 200% of its rated opacity, it, the maximum clearing time is 12 seconds. For these other classes, you can see that the standard also says that you have to be able to hold higher magnitudes of current. Although that's for shorter lengths of time, you can also see the amount of time changes. Uh, without getting too much into the minutia of the standard, the basic concept is that large fuses should be able to hold current for greater lengths of time. This allows for coordination to let those downstream fuses clear an overcurrent first before uh, a main on a switchboard or something upstream opens up. Uh, for example, if you take a look, a 30 amp fuse needs to hold 200% of its rated opacity, uh, and it needs to hold it for 4 minutes, whereas a 600 amp fuse needs to hold it for 14 minutes at the other end of that 200% spectrum. For very large fuses, uh, larger than 600 amps, the standard doesn't even define what those 135% and 200% thresholds are. Rather, it has a unique threshold of 150%, which is defined for those size fuses. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, let's talk about the differences between RK1 and RK5, RK5 fuses. I know that when I first started out in the industry, I always had a, a devil of a time trying to understand the difference between these. At first, I thought they were more or less interchangeable, which they are in terms of physical size. Uh, you can have the same opacity fuse for an RK1 and an RK5, and they'll fit in exactly the same fuse clips. However, RK1s and RK5s have different time current characteristics. RK1s have greater current limit, limiting characteristics than RK5s. RK1s are also faster acting than RK5s. In some cases, utilization equipment with having unusually high inrush current, um, this may not be acceptable for that type of application. However, since RK5s are slower than RK1s, you will have more left through current, more time before that fuse actually melts. If we think in terms of I squared T, you increase the time variable of that equation, and you get a heck of a lot more energy that's being released to whatever is downstream. Th this may not be an issue depending on where that fuse is located in your distribution, but it's still something that you should consider. Um, before we advance to the next slide, take a quick look at the picture. There's two fuses in the picture. One is a 100 amp RK5, and the other one is a 200 amp RK5. Uh, look at the f copper fuse blades on either end of the body. Do you see that notch in the uh, fuse blade on the lower part of the picture? Those are the rejection fi uh, features that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Here's, here's the fun part. Uh, I cut open that, R, that 200 amp RK5 fuse in a previous slide, and this is what's inside of the fuse. You can see that there's two distinct parts of the fusible element within the cartridge body. We have a short circuit element on the right and an overload element on the left. So the question is, uh, how does it work? Well, that short circuit element is a, a thin strip of copper, and you can see the holes are punched into it in a regular pattern. Uh, where the holes are punched, the cross-sectional area of the copper is significantly reduced. 
that part where the copper necks down is surrounded by sand, and that sand is a pretty effective heat sink. However, with very high fall currents, the heat can't be dissipated quickly enough, and the copper vaporizes at that point. The sand is also really effective at quenching the arc that's formed when that copper melts. Now, if you look at the left side of the fuse, you can see the overload element. Although it's a bit hard to see with the sand sticking to it, there's a solder-like material where that silver cylinder meets the copper strip sort of in the middle. That material melts under sustained overload conditions. It heats up and it melts. What you can't see is that in that silver cylinder, there's a spring. As the solder melts, the spring tension will help pull apart that portion of the element and open the circuit. Um, hopefully the pictures help make uh, the earlier descriptions a little bit clearer. So let's move on to how that element in the fuse reacts to various magnitudes of overcurrent. Based on what we've seen so far, you should be getting an, the impression that these overcurrent protection devices will react differently depending on how much current they see, whether it's a minor overload condition or a major fault on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, to be able to compare two different types of overcurrent protection devices, you need something that's called a time current curve. All manufacturers for fuses and circuit breakers have these, and they're all in a similar format, so you can make easy comparisons between the various different devices. Now, if you're not familiar with a time current curve, you should look closely at this particular graph. You'll notice that the scales on the y and, x, y and x axis aren't linear. They're a log-log scale. So our per unit values go from on the, uh, on the axis from 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100 and so forth and so on. And these time current curves, time in seconds is always on that vertical y axis on the uh, left side, and the current in amps is on the horizontal x axis at the bottom. Uh, this particular time current curve that we have here is for a 100 amp RK5 fuse. Uh, that red band represents the minimum and maximum melt times for the elements in a fuse. Everything on the left side of that uh, band is no a normal operating condition, and the fuse won't open. But once you hit that red band or go to the right of it, the fuse element will melt and the circuit will open. Uh, you can see that that red band isn't a, a thin line. There's some, there's some weight to it. Uh, this is due to manufacturing tolerances. Uh, so the fuse is guaranteed to open somewhere within that red band, but not at a specific ampacity at a specific time. So you can also see if you follow the graph up the time scale towards that 200 second mark. If you cross reference that with the current, you can see that the fuse can hold substantially more current than 100 amps for that period of time. And again, this is a 100 amp fuse. If you recall from an earlier slide, there is a 200% max melt time defined within the NEMA FU1 standard. Uh, unfortunately, the time basis on these curves don't go up to the ultimate 100 amp rating of that fuse, but just from how the curve veers to the left at the top, uh, as the time basis increases, you should be able to visualize roughly where that happens. Um, be before I hand it back to Tom, let's take a another look at the bottom of that curve where we have a, a very high magnitude of current. Um, basically how that fuse reacts in a fault condition. That will be a bit more important when we start comparing thermomagnetic circuit breakers and fuses. And I'll hand it back to Tom. Okay, thanks John. So now let's talk about circuit breakers. So what is a circuit breaker? As you can see here, the NEC definition is a device designed to open the circuit automatically on a predetermined overcurrent without damage to itself when properly applied within its rating. So basically, a circuit breaker can be opened and closed against all magnitudes of current up to its short circuit current rating. The UL standard that normally applies to most circuit breakers is UL489, and that's the one we'll take the closest look at today, although there are others. And uh, these breakers use either a thermal magnetic trip element or a solid state electronic trip element. And we'll look at each of those and how they differ. All right, a thermal magnetic circuit breaker is probably the most common type used on branch circuits today. It uses material properties to identify an overload. 
And how it does that is there are two conductive strips of material that are bonded together, and they have different characteristics. So one will expand with temperature rise faster than the other. So when an overcurrent occurs over time, the metals will expand at different rates as the temperature goes up, and the strip will then bend in a way that trips the circuit breaker. Then there's a second element, an electromagnetic element, that responds to the magnetic field that's created by high currents in a fault situation. And this can also trip the breaker. So here is a picture. Uh, John had his saw out, and so he not only cut a fuse in half, but also hopefully cut us this uh, branch circuit breaker. And you can see the inside. This is a thermomagnetic type. Uh, the blue dashed line indicates the path of current flow from the bottom left, where it would connect to a bus, to the right, where the load terminal is located. It works kind of like a mouse trap when either of the elements, either the thermal element or the magnetic element, responds to an abnormal current condition, it will interact with the latch. And that will release the spring, which will separate the switch contacts far enough to interrupt the flow of current. All right, now let's look at a time current curve for this type of circuit breaker and compare it to that one we saw for a fuse just a few slides ago. So like before, Anything to the left of this curve or below it will not trip the circuit breaker. And to the right of the curve will, not, will trip it. And then the hash band for the circuit breaker is also about manufacturing tolerance. It will trip somewhere in that band, uh, but for each particular breaker, it, it, it will fall at a slightly different place. The hash band on this circuit breaker is much wider than what we saw earlier for a fuse. And uh, so I think that's important to note. But you also note that there is an abrupt change in the shape at about a half a second. The rectilinear shape below that point represents the magnetic element. And then the curved shape above represents the thermal element. So a magnetic-only breaker would look like the L-shaped curve, but just continued upwards towards infinity. And you might see that on motor protection. Note also the horizontal band in the instantaneous region at the very bottom right. So what this represents is that for any current above 1,000 amps, the circuit, breaker will, the, the circuit breaker will attempt to trip as quickly as it can with no intentional delay. And you can see the top of that horizontal band is at about one cycle, and that represents that the breaker will definitely trip within that amount of time. And it's not visible on this graph, but I'd like to point out that there is an end to that horizontal line. It ends at the available fault current, the available short circuit current, uh, in the particular application where this, this breaker is located. And that will vary based on the system and the available sources and uh, resistances and reactances within the, within the circuit. The other type of trip unit that we'll talk about today is a solid state or electronic trip unit. Solid state units will measure current using current transformers rather than material properties and then a microprocessor determines when to trip the circuit breaker. Current transformers are much more precise than the elements of a thermomagnetic breaker, so you'll see later that the band in which the breaker might trip, that manufacturing tolerance, is much thinner, although not as thin as the fuse curve we saw. The trip curves for solid state units can be highly adjustable, which can dramatically improve protection over a thermal mag breaker in some situations. But the instantaneous protection against low resistance faults cannot be turned off or defeated for UL489 breakers. And so when we talk about selective coordination and, and there are other applications where you may have a need to delay the operation of the breaker or avoid uh, tripping in that instantaneous region entirely, and uh, to do that you would need a different type of breaker. 
um, low voltage power circuit breakers, which are built to UL1066 and ANSI C37, do allow this uh, in, in some cases. But they have to be able to withstand fault current for a much longer period of time. Um, a UL489 breaker and, and uh, switchboards and panel boards are rated for three cycles. Uh, to use a breaker like that, it must be rated to withstand fault current for 30 cycles. So how would you choose between fuses and circuit breakers? John? Okay. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit more about directly comparator comparing fuses and circuit breakers. So let's compare the operating characteristics of the two. Uh, of course, you know, there's an incredible variety of fuses and circuit breaker types out there, each with its own specific time current characteristic. Um, however, to illustrate a point, let's just have uh, a generic example. Let's look at a generic 100 amp thermal mag breaker and uh, 100 amp RK5 fuse. Uh, this particular picture is a direct overlay at the time current curves for each of these two devices. The diffuse is the red line and the circuit breaker is in blue. Uh, when these are overlaid, the differences are quite pronounced in how they react to uh, overcurrent conditions. You can see that characteristic transition between the magnetic and thermal overload protection functions and the blue band at about half a cycle, um, about uh, half a second, about 30 cycles. Uh, we can also see that in this particular case, the circuit breaker reacts considerably faster in the overload region of the graph um, at the top. And remember that this is a log-log graph. Those aren't linear scales on the axis. However, if we take a look further down at the short time region of the graph where the magnetic function of the circuit breaker operates, there's a pretty high level of uncertainty regarding where that circuit breaker will trip in comparison to the fuse. Again, it can trip anywhere in that blue region, which uh, encompasses a, a very wide number of uh, overcurrent conditions. So if we go down to that 0.01 second region of the circuit breaker fuse of the the circuit breaker time current curve. We can see that that dog leg that's characteristic of a thermal mag circuit breaker is at roughly about one cycle or 0.0167 seconds. I apologize. It's sort of hard to see the scale on the side of the uh, of the graph. Uh, but anyway, the, the circuit breaker can trip anywhere within that blue shaded region. But if you compare it to that red band representing the, the total melt, the average melt time for the fuse, um, it's, that fuse is really well defined in that same region. So down in that particular region, I can't tell you if the fuse or circuit breaker will open the, that circuit first based on a specific overcurrent or fault condition. Um, well, let's move on to pros and cons. There are some people that prefer fuses and there's other people that prefer circuit breakers. Everyone has their own personal opinion. Uh, however, we're not here to say that fuses or circuit breakers are any better or worse than each other. Rather, based on your particular application, you should understand relative advantages and disadvantages of each and make a determination what makes the most sense based on your budget and protection requirements. Uh, let's roll through the pros and cons of fuses first. Uh, under the advantages for fuses, they have generally a very high interrupt rating. 100,000 amps and 200,000 amps are usually common. And that interrupt rating doesn't change with voltage, whereas oftentimes with circuit breakers, depending on what the available fault is uh, or what the, uh, what the uh, system voltage is, the available uh, interrupt rating may change. Um, as we saw from the, the previous slide where we overlaid the uh, thermal mag and uh, fuse time current curves, we have better short circuit protection uh, characteristics. And fuses are often current limiting, um, but there has to be a caveat here. Fuses don't limit current for all values of 
fall current. Uh, there's a concept called threshold current ratio. If the fall current is equal or greater than that specific threshold current ratio, then the fuse is current limiting. Uh, this ratio can range anywhere from about 30 times to 65 times the rated impacity of the fuse based on the size of the fuse in the fuse class. So for very high magnitudes of fault, they're really effective at limiting current. However, for lower magnitudes of fault, like you would have in a, a non-bolted fault type condition like an arcing event, they may not be particularly effective in limiting fault current. So that second part about arc flash, again, it's dependent on what the magnitude of the fault is. Um, as we also saw, they can be easier to perform selective coordination just because we don't have that characteristic dog leg at the bottom, which will often overlap when you have multiple different circuit breakers in series of each other. Um, as far as downsides uh, with use of fuses, uh, there is an individual element for each phase that you're protecting in a three-phase uh, switch. Uh, so there's the potential for popping one fuse and the other fuses remaining conductive, and that can result in potential single phasing and back feeding of whatever your downstream load is. Uh, also, fuses are one-time use only. Um, after you melt uh, the element within a fuse, it has to be replaced, and there's a cost associated with that. Uh, for larger uh, fuse switches, uh, you may have certain requirements per the code for ground fault protection, maybe shunt trip or some other things. And those are not inherently um, part of what a fuse switch is, so you have additional costs associated with act adding those to the fuse switch. Uh, and as you, if you think about what we saw in those previous overlays of the time current curves, circuit breakers are generally slower uh, in overload conditions. Uh, fuses are generally slower than circuit breakers in overload conditions. Um, and the fuse switches are also physically larger than a comparable circuit breaker. And uh, as Tom was talking about with solid state trip units, um, while you can adjust the time current characteristics of a circuit breaker, Whatever you get with a fuse, you can't adjust that characteristic. Uh, finally, um, we do have arc flash reduction requirements for circuit breakers that, will, that are in the current code. Um, and these will come eventually to fuse switches. The only question is when. It, it's not going to be introduced in the 27 and, uh, and the 2017 NEC, but potentially it's coming in the 2020 NEC. Okay, moving on to the pros and cons of circuit breakers. One of the biggest pros of uh, the circuit breaker is that it's resettable. If you trip it during an overcurrent condition, it can be reset, whereas with a fuse, you're physically removing and replacing fuses. Um, and, and as we saw from the time current curves before, um, circuit breakers generally operate faster under overload conditions than a fuse. Uh, we also have the ability to adjust the time current curve with electronic trip units. Um, we also have availability of accessories that address other protection requirements. Uh, the code does have requirements for um, personnel protection for ground fault in uh, Article 210.8 and, uh, and for equipment as well in 23095. In some cases, uh, we do have coordination issues, but with electronic trip units, you can perform zone selective interlocking, uh, and that will help you with coordination and selectivity. Uh, also, we don't have issues that we have with fuses with single phasing and back feeding because when a circuit breaker trips, it opens all poles at the same time. And the UL standards for circuit breakers and fuse switches are a little bit different in that the UL standard has a, a greater quantity of physical switching operations within the standard, so uh, a circuit breaker will have greater endurance than a, a similar fuse switch. It. Uh, going down to the disadvantages of circuit breakers, typically you'll have a lower short circuit current rating than a fuse. Again, with a fuse, 100,000 amp and 200,000 amp are fairly common, but circuit breakers can be all over the place and they may vary depending on what your system voltage is for any specific given circuit breaker. Um, they can be very difficult to provide selective coordination if you have a standard therm thermal uh, standard thermal magnetic circuit breaker. And you have higher initial costs 
for a circuit breaker, and often they're not current limiting, which would have a, a very big issue when you start talking about arc flash requirements. And I'll hand it off to Tom. All right, so let's look at some uh, examples of how to protect types of equipment and conductors and uh, some applications of these devices. First off, NEC Article 240 is your first, uh, first place to look if you don't know how to protect a certain piece of equipment. If you don't know where to start, start here. This article provides general requirements for overcurrent protection in a variety of circumstances, and it also contains a handy reference table, 240.3, that references all the other portions of the National Electric Code that define overcurrent protection requirements. And that table is arranged by the name of the equipment that needs to be protected. Note that each power distribution system has somewhat different characteristics that could affect protection choices. We're not going to talk a lot about this here today, but uh, we want to make the audience aware that they need to be careful about peculiarities. For example, a high resistance grounded system would not see high current levels when a fault is present, so the fuses and circuit breakers would not trip. And so you need additional sensing equipment to alert maintenance personnel to the presence of a fault during that situation and keep them safe from harm. And that would be different from what you would see in a solidly grounded system, which is what we've been assuming so far. Now, we will look at a couple of examples, starting with a, a conductor, a, a, a building wire. On this time current curve, in addition to the circuit breaker trip curve on the left and the fuse trip curve on the right, there is a red line that's the same on both graphs. And that line represents the thermal damage curve for a, a building wire, in this case, a number six AWG wire. So if the amount of current present in the system for the amount of time, the, the duration that that fault is present or that overcurrent situation is present reaches that red line, then the, the conductor will be damaged. And so we want to keep the protective devices curved to the left and below that line. And you can see uh, in both of these graphs, both of these 60 amp devices, the thermal mag breaker and the 60 amp fuse are adequately protecting this wire. So wires are straightforward to, uh, to protect, but transformers are a little bit more complicated. Uh, in this graph, there is a thermal damage curve for the transformer, which is the green line at the top of the graph. But unlike a wire, a transformer causes an inrush of current when it's first energized. And the peak of that inrush current is represented on this graph by a green X, which is sort of hard to see because it's behind the red of the breaker curve, but it is at a tenth of a second. And since the trip curve of this breaker is overlapping that X, it means that it might nuisance trip as soon as the transformer is energized and it sees that inrush current. Because it's in the hashed area, we don't know for certain, uh, but is, it's possible. And the other thing to note here is that this breaker is not protecting the transformer because its curve is to the right of the thermal damage curve shown there in green. And uh, so this is not an adequate protection, protection device for this application. And so here for the first time we are showing a, an electronic trip or solid state trip circuit breaker. And as you can see it is much more adjustable. It has a lot of different segments and each of these can be moved to the left or the right, moved up or down in most cases, except for the instantaneous region. And uh, so I have chosen settings here that allow the circuit breaker to protect the wire and be to the left and below the thermal damage curve, but also at the bottom to be to the right of the transformer inrush point so that the breaker will not trip when the transformer is first energized. All right, and there are many more examples. We didn't have time for all of them, but uh, now I'll turn it over to John to talk a little bit about some um, application issues related to selective coordination and arc flash. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, let's move on to selective coordination. 
Uh, in this particular slide, you can see the NEC definition for selective coordination. Um, just reading through it, localization of an overcurrent condition to restrict outage to the circuit or equipment affected accomplished by the selection of an installation of overcurrent protection devices, and you can read the rest of that. Uh, this term selective coordination has been in the code for a while. However, the definition in the 2014 version of the NEC was significantly expanded from that in the 2011 code. Basically, that entire second half of the definition, of the definition all that stuff after the phrase rating and setting was, acted, was added uh, to the definition. Uh, so th the question is, what exactly is the code trying to tell us here? Well, regardless if it's an overload or a fault condition, we want to limit any potential disruption or outage to the smallest possible portion of our electrical distribution. Uh, for, for example, if we have an elevator hoist motor experiencing a, a short circuit or some other type of overcurrent condition, we want our overcurrent protection device that's closest to that piece of equipment to trip and clear the fault condition. We don't want an upstream device like the main and the service switchboard to trip first and take out the entire electrical service for the building. We only want the protective device closest to the disturbance to open and leave the rest of the distribution energized. Uh, well, that may seem like just plain common sense, but it can be pretty hard to accomplish in, in practice. To make that point, uh, you can see in the slide here a generic time current curve overlay between a 125 amp and a 60 amp multi case circuit breaker. And in this particular example, you can see that it, there is a significant amount of overlap between the two curves up to about half a second. That overlap is really bad in that one cycle region, that 0.167 second region of the curve where you see that dog leg at the bottom. So what happens if the magnitude of your fault current just happens to fall in that overlap region? Does the 125 amp circuit breaker trip first or does the 60 amp circuit breaker trip first? And your guess is as good as mine here. Uh, it's basically a horse race at this point and that's a problem. Okay, uh, so we're trying to we, we can see that trying to accomplish selective coordination can be hard, especially in that instantaneous region for generic multi-case circuit breakers. Uh, there has been some level of selective coordination requirements for Article 700 systems since the 2005 code, basically life safety systems. And if you think about it, that makes sense. While it might be an inconvenience to have an electrical outage, if that outage extends to life safety systems, that inconvenience has the potential to become something much more serious. Uh, the code has been slowly changing over the last few revision cycles to reflect its emphasis on ensuring the reliability of life safety related systems. Um, COPS, critical operation power systems, that got added in the 2008 code. Uh, elevators, legally required standby systems, and uh, fire pumps, those all got added in the 2011 code. Uh, healthcare finally got added in the 2014 code. N now remember that the definition for selective coordination was significantly expanded with the 2014 version of the code. It now requires uh, selectivity uh, direct from that uh, definition over a full range, uh, let's emphasize that, a, a full range of overcurrent conditions from overload to maximum available fault. Again, this can be wildly difficult for standard thermomagnetic circuit breakers in the instantaneous region, especially where that characteristic dog leg occurs in the one cycle time frame. Uh, only Article 517 offers um, some relief where that selective coordination only has to be performed down to a tenth of a second. But everything else, it just says selectively coordinated. So the full range of overcurrent has to be coordinated. When you consider the time current characteristics for fuses in this instantaneous region, you can immediately see that there's less chance for overlap of the time current curves. Um, that dog leg that's characteristic of thermomagnetic circuit breakers is missing, making it, making it much easier to coordinate fuses. Uh, the general rule of thumb is, is, is that if you maintain a two to one ratio between the upstream and downstream fuses, they will usually be selectively coordinated. Uh, this is another fun one. Um, 
let's touch briefly on arc energy reduction. Uh, this in and of itself, um, this is a monster topic and merits a webinar all by itself. However, we really don't have enough time here to give you much more than a quick overview of this topic. Talking about this topic brings us around full circle. Again, the intent behind the code is to protect people from the hazards associated with the use of, elect of electricity. And arc flash is a very real hazard. Uh, arc flash is characterized by the uncontrolled release of energy from an arcing fault. And there's often an incredible amount of heat in a shock wave that's generated that can burn and kill people in, media, in immediate proximity to that fault. While um, NFPA 70E, uh, the maintenance code, has some guidelines associated with arc flash safety, we really haven't seen any provisions within the NEC regarding arc flash until the 2014 edition. Uh, this ti the title of the new NEC article, uh, as you can see from the title of the slide, is Arc Energy Reduction. This provision affects all circuit breakers that can be adjusted to 1,200 amps or more. Uh, the, the key word there is adjusted. So if you have a 1,200 amp frame circuit breaker and an interchangeable 1,000 amp rating plug on its uh, electronic trip unit, it still applies to that circuit breaker even though the plug rating is only 1,000 amps. Uh, so let's emphasize the energy part of that arc energy reduction title. If you reduce the energy, you reduce the chance for burns. However, the question is here, how do we reduce that uh, released energy? Uh, you can find the equation for calculating the theoretical possible incident energy in the back of uh, NFPA 70E. And the primary variable in that equation um, are distance from the arc, the time duration of that arc, and the available short circuit current, those three variables. While we can't necessarily control how close a person is to an arc flash, we can sometimes control the magnitude of the available fault current but with fuses and circuit breakers, we can most certainly control that time duration or how quickly that fuse or circuit breaker opens. If we can trip a circuit breaker faster or somehow reduce the available fault current, that should reduce the amount of energy that's released. Um, the code defines a, a variety of acceptable methods for reducing that energy. Uh, the acceptable methods are zone selective interlocking, a differential relay, which does more or less the same thing, an energy reducing uh, maintenance switch, which basically causes the circuit breaker to trip faster, uh, an energy reducing active arc flash mitigation, and finally uh, a proved equivalent method, which is a little bit nebulous. That last uh, one is sort of a catch-all to allow it to address other emerging technologies that would more or less accomplish the same thing as the uh, clearly defined methods. Most of these methods mentioned in the slide address that time component. In other words, uh, cause that circuit breaker to trip faster. However, you would generally require an electronic trip unit with a certain amount of intelligence to accomplish that. Okay, I think we are most certainly running out of time, so I'll hand it back to Jack. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tom, for that great presentation. Uh, type your questions for our speakers in the Ask Question box, and we'll take, we have time for a couple of questions. If you are on Twitter, tweet your questions to hashtag CSE Circuit Protection. Additional information will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of the webcast and to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES learning unit certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option on your screen. Now let's get to some of these questions. While we still have some time, here's Tom, the first one goes to you. Uh, what are the pitfalls and advantages of using the 0 0.1 second rule for selective coordination of OCPDs? Okay, well, I'll answer this uh, quickly so we can get to a few others. As, as we heard from John, the definition of selective coordination in Article 100 does not include any time restriction. And so uh, technically, for devices to be selectively coordinated, they would have to coordinate through a full range of all possible times, including very, very short ones. And as we saw, circuit breakers are hard to coordinate in that range. Um, 517.30G for healthcare does specify 0.1 seconds for selective coordination in, in that application. And so 
that is now clear with the newer versions of the code, and, and I don't think there are any pitfalls or advantages of using the number because it's in the code. But for other applications where there's no time specified, it can be very expensive to meet selective coordination in all ranges with circuit breakers. And uh, so we've seen a lot of jurisdictions start to make interpretations to allow uh, coordination down to a certain amount of time, either 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. And that's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction issue. So if you are trying to save money and use circuit breakers, or if you are trying to coordinate devices that are very close in rating like a 60 amp branch circuit breaker and a 100 amp main breaker panel, then um, you, you may have trouble meeting the requirements in those low ranges. And so it's really a question for your local authority having jurisdiction as to whether they will accept devices that are, are protected above that 0 0.1 seconds or some other number that they might have already used in, in another application or might agree to for yours. Uh, but the pitfalls would be to use that without their agreement would put you in a place where you're potentially in conflict with the code and the way it would be interpreted in that particular uh, uh, facility. Okay, thank you, Tom. And we have time for one more question. And John, it goes to you. We have a viewer that has a fan with a 15 horsepower, 480 volt motor that pulls around six times full load amp starting current, and the fuse fuse is blue on the startup. And this person asks if time delay fuses are acceptable. Well, the, the primary question to ask there is how are you protecting the load? Um, you're trying to start the load and you have an unusual high level of inrush current. Depending on the, the NEMA design type, you can be anywhere from 600 to 800% full load current to start a motor uh, at locked rotor. And depending on how quickly that motor accelerates, you may not be able to fit under a, a standard uh, fast-acting fuse curve. Uh, that's a particular reason why dual element time delay fuses were designed in the first place. It increases the area under the curve in that short time region and gives you a chance to physically accelerate that fan up to operating speed before you hit that minimum melt time curve. Um, so while uh, a slow blow fuse may make sense, um, you still have to protect it in the normal operating region. And in those particular cases, it's recommended to use a dual element time delay fuse where you can actually address the uh, overload region as well. Hey, John. I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Tom Earp and John Yoon, for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsors, ASCO, for supporting today's webcast. And finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, thanks for attending this webcast. This now concludes our webcast event. Thank you, and goodbye.